Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? He's trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Uh, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of the day or night it is, Entrepreneurship and Leadership Channel listener on the New Books Network. Today, we've got a very special guest, John Sloan, who I believe is in Dallas, Texas. He's president of J. Sloan & Co., has a very varied and interesting career. But John, rather than me try to introduce you, why don't you do it the way you'd do it if you had 30 or 60 seconds at some kind of party or networking event? Well, terrific. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you today, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, here, in, uh, here in Texas. I, I grew up in Texas, and... Uh, uh, you, you might think about what does that look like? What does that really mean? Well, I'm kind of the stereotype of, of someone who was born here. I grew up in very rural East Texas, uh, had uh, 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 in a little town of 2,000 people. There were 60 people in my high school graduating class. Uh, from the time I was six years old, I was riding a horse and tending cattle on my father's farm. <laughs> uh, nice. when, I was in, when I was in high school, I worked as a grocery clerk in his, in his grocery store. And when I was in college, I worked on highway construction gangs. Uh, building Sorry, highways. did I hear in his grocery store? Your, your dad had a grocery store as well? Yes, he did. He did. Okay. But he was an entrepreneur. He, he was an entrepreneur. He, he was a cattle man and, and he had a, had a grocery store and, uh, and all. But uh, the, the purpose in telling you all of that is really twofold. One is uh, I grew up in an environment where I came to appreciate a great work ethic, okay, which I think is critical to anyone who has success in business. And secondly, those experiences were great motivation to go to college and get an education. <laughs> okay. And, and, and was, that, was, it, was, it, was it useful? an education? Oh, absolutely. I attended the University of Texas. I got a degree in accounting. Uh, I became a CPA. I worked for okay. one of the firms that rolled up into a PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, when I graduated from college, I uh, went immediately into the United States Marine Corps. And uh, this was in the middle of the Vietnam War, so difficult time for the military and all. I was stationed in Southern California. And uh, on the weekends, uh, I would go to the library on uh, the campus of the uh, uh, Marine base there, and I would read business books. And the books that intrigued me most were the ones about individuals who were involved in transactional aspects of business. And that infatuated me from the very beginning. And kind of the financial background, uh, I came about through education and through my experience working for a CPA firm, really firm the foundation for what I wanted to do later in my business career, which was be involved in transactional uh, situations, being involved in the merger and acquisition field, being involved in private equity, investment banking, and, and things of that variety. So it all started on kind of long walks on Saturday and Sunday afternoons around San Diego, thinking about the future and what I thought I wanted to do. Nice. And, and so just from a, so just to get the, the order right, college and then you worked did, then you worked for the company that was uh, that was uh, that was acquired by Pricewaterhouse Coopers and then you went to the Marines or was it the no, other way? I went to I went to the Marines straight out of college okay, okay straight out of college straight, okay. straight from college to the Marines I actually started uh, working uh, during my senior junior and senior years in college for uh, for a CPA firm there in Austin Texas where I was attending college uh, right out of college I went into the Marine Corps I came out of that. I was recruited by one of the firms, one of the so-called big eight firms at that time. Right. Uh, and then that firm ultimately merged into what's now PricewaterhouseCoopers. Hmm. And okay. why, why, why did you go for the army? I, OK, let's just think about your, your family pressures. Your dad was an entrepreneur and a farmer. You'd had these pretty tough jobs by your own account. But I think any listener would identify like hard <laughs> grueling jobs. You you studied because you didn't want to do that. But then you went for the army, which particularly during the Vietnam War, or the Marines, I should say, doesn't sound like a, like a soft choice. So wh why did you do that? Uh, it, it was not a soft choice. And uh, I, I was not actually looking for a soft choice. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to serve my country. I, I wanted to fulfill my military obligation. Uh, there was an individual in my hometown who had uh, served in the Marine Corps and really sponsored me and encouraged me to sign up for the Marine Corps. And through that experience, I think a lot of other life lessons came along, <laughs> uh, which, which would have served me well for, for a long time. 
And so uh, that experience was, was, was very valuable to me in that respect. But you didn't go, you didn't actually go to Vietnam, did you? I did not. Uh, in fact, I served my entire, uh, my entire tour of duty. I served in San Diego, California. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that worked, but, uh, <laughs> but I was happy to stay in San Diego. Oh yes, that sounds like a fortunate, uh, <laughs> but still I'm sure it was, it, it, it wasn't easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy itself. I mean, uh, there must've been, well, the, yeah, sorry. Yeah the, yeah, the Marine Corps is known for being very challenging. Okay, yeah. and, and it was, uh, but again, a valuable life experience for me. I kind of built on the, the work ethic that I'm looking back, I think I uh, came by as I was growing up and going to college and serving in the Marine Corps. And I think it's really one of the very fundamentals to be successful in anything you, you do in life. It really takes focus and a dedication and a commitment to, to be successful. And, and what did you learn from your time in the Marines that later was useful in business apart from the work ethic? I, I'm thinking, particularly thinking about leadership. Are there any things that you particularly remember from that time that later on gave you an edge compared to people who hadn't done that? I think looking back, uh, you, you, you've hit the key word leadership. Uh, I remember Marine Corps boot camp. Uh, Marine Corps boot camp in those days was 16 weeks long. So it was a real grueling physical experience. And there were like, 75 of us in a what called a platoon at that time going through boot camp together. Uh, I was one of the few uh, there that uh, actually had a college education. And, and I think that uh, in those days, uh, learned about how to, uh, you know, gain the confidence of other people there that I didn't know from uh, other, uh, uh, you know, parts of the country. Um, uh, maybe most of them or a lot of them had dropped out of high school and went straight to the military service. And so being able to uh, identify and communicate with, uh, with, with those people and, and, and gain their confidence, I think, was a, was, a valuable, uh, was a valuable leadership lesson. So moving on, um, you see then right out, of the, right out of the military, recruited into the, one of the top eight, uh, big eight. How long did you do that for? I was there for about two and a half, three years. Okay, not so long, actually. Exactly, and and again, uh, it, kind of thinking back to my Marine Corps days, when I was thinking about what I really thought I wanted to do, being involved in some kind of transactional business. Uh, when I got into public accounting, I apparently was very good at public accounting. <laughs> all right, and uh, uh, but uh, I found myself tracking along behind those who had actually done the deals, who had actually done the transactions, and I wanted to get right. in an environment where I was the one actually doing that, uh, as opposed to coming along and accounting for that after the fact. Uh, so it, it's a kind of a trail there, if you think about it, from sure. where I was coming from. In, it was it's it's, well, it's a lot it's a lot sexier to be the guys in front than the guys than the bean counters in the back. I think you're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, also there's a very good point which anyone listening to this can think about and take away from this that whatever job you're doing at whatever level, look around for people who, and you, if you think I would like to be doing their job, that's a powerful, obviously you need to check, it might look a lot better than it is in reality, but anyway, you identified that you wanted to be doing the, doing the deals, doing the transactions, and so, exactly. how, and so how did you, how did, what was, how did you get from where you were to where you are now, <laughs> to, to, actually, to actually be doing that? Well, uh, I had uh, left public accounting uh, when I uh, received an offer from one of my clients. <clears throat> it's a publicly held company here in Dallas to come as their chief financial officer. And I guess the real allure of that at that time was it was far more financially rewarding for me to do that. Um, of course. And, and, and so I did. And that worked out well for a couple of years. But during that time, uh, I was introduced to uh, the Thompson family here in Dallas. Uh, and this was an incredible career break for me uh, because the Thompsons were the founders uh, of the 7-Eleven convenience store chain, which is headquartered oh, wow. here That's in huge. Dallas. Okay. And uh, there, at the time I came along, there were, there were three brothers, uh, sons of the descendant uh, of the father who had, uh, who had passed away. Uh, it, it's a great story. If I could digress for 30 seconds. Sure. To tell you we about love it. stories. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> Uh, th this was back before home refrigeration came along, and he had an ice house in South Dallas. And so after work, uh, people would stop off and they would buy a block of ice, so they would buy crushed ice. And uh, after a while, he thought, well, I, if I sold soft drinks and candy and 
other convenience shopping <laughs> items, I could increase my income. And so all of a sudden, you know, he's selling a lot of that stuff. And then he had the brilliant idea to open a um, uh, open a store that sold only convenience food shopping items. And the store was open from seven in the morning to 11 at night. That's where the name came ah, from. Seven nice. 11. So uh, he had, uh, he had, he had passed on it. And so that, that was the foundation of what today is a worldwide enterprise of some 60,000 7 Eleven stores sure. around the world. It's massive. Okay. So when I came along, uh, 7 Eleven was a publicly held New York Stock Exchange company here in Dallas. The family owned the largest interest in the public company, but they wanted to diversify their family wealth. And this is where I got my first big break. Uh, they, they brought me in to set up what we would today call a family office. It wasn't sure. even heard of in that time. But I started out with uh, an assistant, uh, not part of the 7-Eleven business, but strictly the family operations who wanted to but hold diversify on a second, their John, family. John, John, hold on a second. How did they, I mean, this is amazing. How did they get you, like, how did they, well, you must have done, you must have done something. Like, how did you get this break? Like, let's talk about the break. How did you get to know these people <laughs> that they're going to trust you to run the family office? Yeah. How, you, well, they didn't know it was they didn't know it was a family office at the time. Neither did I. <laughs> this, that was before the term even came along. And uh, uh, I was actually introduced by a, a lawyer who uh, had become close to the family and who knew of their interest and what they were looking to do outside of their Seven Eleven business. And so he provided an introduction for me uh, over a series of uh, interviews and meetings over uh, a number of months. It just kind of came together and. Uh, they offered me the position of being president and CEO of something called the Thompson Company, uh, which became their family holding company for their other privately held and some publicly held uh, uh, businesses that wow. we invested uh, how, in. How old were you, John, at the time? How old were you at the time? I was early 30s at this point. Wow. I mean, look at this. It's a huge, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge opportunity, really. It's a, it's amazing. And so, uh, but you must have talked to the lawyer. I, I sorry, I, I sorry, that I don't want to focus on this, but I like it because it's like it shows this entrepreneurial. This like, I, like, how did you? You must have is this lawyer your friend. Did you tell him, look, I'm dreaming to my passion is I want to you know buy companies and whatever like help, but you know, do this kind of stuff. And 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 then he just put two and two together and said you might be a good fit. Or how, how did it like? How did you? It's still I'm still curious that's, about that. That's a, that's a pretty good summary. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he knew of my interest to become involved in the transactional investment world, okay? Mm -hmm. And we had gotten to know each other over a couple of years. He, I didn't even know that he knew the family when, when okay, we started exactly. having our, de developing our relationship. And so finally he said, look, I'd like to introduce you to these fellows. And so it was one of those things that when we met, it was just, it, it was just smooth and easy and kind of an instant yeah. Uh, hey, we're, 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 this, this is a common path for us to pursue, um, and and off we went from there. Yeah, no, and because those... it's uh, sorry, it's just so like I, I I talk about this a lot. I think it's really important relationships. You you fostered a relationship. You didn't know where it was, whatever he was. Maybe your friend, whatever, but you didn't necessarily weren't didn't know where it was going. And but but then ultimately the reason you got it, I guess, is because they trusted him. He trusted you. And so that was probably the 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 the, the main yeah. the main thing to say. Well, he's recommending John, so John must be good quality, basically. Yeah, and, and I, I think you've hit upon a key term there, which I, I, you know, attribute a lot of my success to is relationships. Okay, and, and it started back in the public accounting days. It it, it really started to build during the uh, days I was with the Thompson family because that's where I built a lot of the relationships that I have today still with uh, large financial institutions and private equity firms and the businesses uh, internationally. So uh, relationships have been a key part of my success. Awesome. So sorry I have for interrupting the digression. Please, please continue <laughs> on. <laughs> so anyway, my, I started my career with, with the Thompson family. I had a uh, uh, an, an assistant um, uh, secretary, if you will, back in those days. And mm -hmm. uh, I officed a few blocks away from where their headquarters was located. They did not want me commingling with uh, with the 7-Eleven business, which was a wise thing to do at that point. And so from there, uh, uh, we became uh, we became some of the very early participants in what became the leverage buyout business. This, this was when people like uh, Bill Simon were doing the famous Gibson greedy card transactions. It's when 
Ted Forsman was raising his first fund. It's when Colbert, Travis, and Roberts was, was getting formed. And people were doing all of these kind of exotic financings, buying companies. And so that really fit my interest level, as you can tell from my background through the Marine Corps and, and all of that, what I really thought I wanted to do in, in business. And so um, after a couple of years of, of trying to decide how we wanted to expand their, their private businesses, um, the, the family was was confident to support me in in entering that what became the leverage buyout world at that time. So sorry, can I ask about the investment? So was there whole like were there companies already in this holding group, or did you acquire the first ones? There were there were two businesses that the that the family had had acquired, uh, and there were some passive investments like oil and gas interest and in, in, in things of that variety. Right. Uh, but the two companies that that were that, that they owned at that time really were, if I said not performing well, would be a gigantic <laughs> understatement, okay? <laughs> because the, the three brothers were totally consumed running a New York Stock Exchange company, right. yet they had the desire to do other things, but they didn't have yeah. the time to devote to it or the resources yeah. to devote to it. So that's where, where I came along. And I wouldn't say that I solved the problems with those companies, but I was able to get rid of the problems. <laughs> And that enabled us to then sort of turn the corner and get aggressive in looking for ways to grow. Did and, you to, and did you business. sell the company? Did you, did you pretty them up and end up selling those companies? Is that, is exactly. that, is that what you is, Yeah, okay. And exactly. then that maybe started the whole, and then I just, I don't know, was there, did you get, I'm, I'm really curious in this, did they give you, was there like a, did you get an allotment of, was there like a, a fund was there a money that was allocated to this to this business or did you sort of generate it through, the, the sale or the proceeds of those companies and then use that to keep going? What was their... We, it... we, we, we had some capital to work with, but the majority of what we had was their ownership of publicly traded stock in the New York Stock Exchange okay. Company, 7-Eleven, okay? And that was something that lenders were readily willing to accept as collateral for loans. Right. And, and, and we financed uh, basically all of our investments moving forward, uh, you know, from that kind of capital base to work from. Cool. Now, just for the listeners out there, can you just tell them, I know exactly what it is, but can you tell them what a leveraged buyout is? Because I think it's it's going to be important going forward in this conversation. Well, it, it will be. <laughs> so <laughs> a leveraged buyout, let's just say you, you, you've identified a company that you would like to buy. And that company has certain assets that can be used as collateral for loans. It also has cash flow which can be used as collateral for loans. And so the leveraged buyout business was based upon being able to borrow money against the tangible assets of the business and the, and the cash flow of the business in order to fund the acquisition of a company. So for example, let's say you wanted to do a relatively small leveraged buyout and the, and the purchase price was for the company was, was $10 million. Um, and typically you would say, well, would fund 80% of the purchase price by debt, a combination of bank debt and, and subordinated debt or cash flow loans, and 20% with equity. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, during those days, uh, in the early days of, of the leveraged buyout business, uh, your ability to complete transactions was limited only by your imagination and how you could structure the financing to do it, because it was really uh, interesting times in those days to be able to creatively structure those types of those types what of were the interest I, what were the interest rates good i mean what were they like at the time uh were they pretty low i mean because you know they got really low obviously in recent years but did they did they what were the interest rates did that impact because you know as obviously if you're borrowing money then that you're borrowing against the company the company's actually has to pay this money back so you're basically making the company you're putting the company into debt and so the company has to be able to, to finance its debt so the interest rates do become an important, I think, issue in the that. interest rates yeah. became a very important part of it. And, yeah. and in fact, it was the absolute uh, uh, opposite of, of what you just talked about, because oh, okay. in those days, the, the prime rate at one time went to 18 percent. Oh, my right? goodness. And so uh, we were able uh, during that time uh, through an intermediary uh, here in Dallas to be able to borrow money in Switzerland at 6 percent, for example. Oh, wow. Okay, but you borrowed that in Swiss francs versus dollars. So you had to change. <laughs> so then you're taking, you you're trading one risk, risk for risk. another. <laughs> yeah, trading one risk for another. And so, but but that that proved very valuable to us. I did probably 
half a dozen different financings in Switzerland uh, over a period of a few years uh, that took advantage of the of, of, of the of, of the interest rate differential between you know U.S. borrowing cost and Swiss franc borrowing cost, and wow. as it turned out, the the, the the risk of currency you know reduction values and things like that really didn't impact us uh, at all. And I, well, I want to check in a, an observation and uh, a question just for people listening. Uh, the, one of the key points is you're securing the loans on the assets of the people you want to buy. So you're using their assets, not your assets. You need the 20%, but their, their assets can be the collateral. The second right, you're is, risking 20% in that case. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yes. But, but the, yes. The, second, the second side of that is not that easy to sell a company quite often, particularly a smaller company. So were you kind of, um, what's the word, leveraging the inefficiency of the market for companies that if you're out there as a buyer actually th there might be very few other buyers so you're not necessarily in a bidding war for the company and the owners are glad to exit so you can if you if you get lucky you can yeah. get very good deals richard you make an excellent point and in those days it's very unlike what we have today i mean any attractive uh, a company uh, being sold today uh, there's going to be a bidding situation involved for that business okay it's much like an auction process Back then, there were very few of, 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 of those types of transactions. They were all, uh, all of our transactions were privately negotiated, family-owned businesses, not part of an auction process, not part of an investment banking marketing process, simply a one-on-one -on -one, transaction with the owners. And so it's very different then than what you have today. Today, investment banks what run what's called a competitive process. They're gonna put buyers in competition to get the best value, the best terms, and, and things of that variety. Back in that time, you know, the buyers were literally the only opportunity for uh, a privately owned business owner to, in effect, monetize his uh, his his life's work or his investment in his company. So tell us about tell us about the best the, the first big deals. What what was your first big deal? Yeah, and, and how did you? And I was just thinking, how did you? What were the parameters that you were given, or you maybe you weren't given any that you made up yourself for selecting and targeting? Like, what was your process? What was your prospecting process? <laughs> well, uh, it, it was largely <laughs> it was uh, it was largely my initiative. Okay, um, and I don't say that bragging about it, but but in, in those days, it was it was largely what you can uh, what you can develop on your own, and and I would come up with an idea, I would come up with an opportunity. Uh, I had uh, to work with, I had external help in the form of uh, legal counsel. Uh, I had external help in the form of accounting and tax uh, counsel and so forth. And then later on, we started to build out our internal organization, which uh, uh, gave us the ability to do more and expand and do, do more transactions. So it all started uh, kind of in that fashion. And I would come up with an idea. Uh, uh, I would start to what I would call socialize the can idea I, with. Can, the, can I stop, with, stop you and just sure. how 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 did you come up with your ideas? What was your? Because it's, it's actually critical and very important. Like, what <laughs> did you do? Read the news and think that must be profitable. I wonder if any companies are for sale. You know, it, it, uh, Richard, it was a little bit of everything, quite frankly. Uh, one of the biggest, maybe the biggest asset that I had to work with, apart from the stock in the in the public company was the Thompson family name and recognition, uh, both domestically and internationally. And that opened a lot of doors for me. Um, and because they had that recognition, uh, a lot of opportunities came their way. And a lot of those opportunities were not things that 7-Eleven would think about in their business, but the family might be interested in, in uh, a, a separate business. So some of those came through that fashion. Some came. Oh, so they our, then chuck it over the wall, chuck it over the wall to the Thompson company. And exactly. Thompson, yeah, okay. Exactly. That's the way it worked. And some of it came just because, um, you know, uh, they had great reputation with the investment banks in New York. So, oh, and um, they would say, would you be interested in? Yeah. Then, so I would go to New York. They'd provide the introduction, open the doors, and there okay. was, a, was a playground <laughs> almost for me. Okay. So uh, I, I was wondering if it wasn't also like you were like networking. Like I was, I was actually going to, I was sort of wondering, was it Texas based since you're there? Maybe you were just meeting the companies there and those were the first, or maybe that was part of the, 
the market. You knew people in Texas, you know, obviously you must have had connections at that point and, you know, a bigger and bigger network. And maybe you were using your network as well. To, and people, once they hear of you, that you're the guy that buys companies and makes people rich, they start to want to talk to you. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it, it started, it, it started more locally. You're, you're exactly right. And, and I'll give you an example. One of the very first transactions of, of that we did. Um, and, and this was someone that um, uh, I believe the Thompson family knew they maybe had approached him or someone had approached him on behalf of this company. Uh, and there was an entrepreneur over in Fort Worth, which is close by to Dallas, as you may know. And he had, uh, he had invented uh, a very small gas impregnated plastic bead. And you think, well, what in the world is that? Well, today that's <laughs> what a coffee cup is made from. That's what a food <laughs> container, takeout right. food container is, is made from, right. all right? And so he had invented, uh, he had invented this small plastic bead and he had a big facility in Fort Worth that manufactured these things. And he turned around and he sold those to the companies that actually you know, manufactured the coffee cup itself, as an example. So you take the little bead, put it in the machine, you got pressure and heat and it expands and it forms a coffee cup. And so we bought, uh, we bought that company. Um, and then what became typical of our approach after that, we started looking for other ways to vertically integrate that business. So one of the first things we did, we bought the second largest manufacturer of coffee cups in the United States. So we were both the raw material supplier and then we were the consumer that built those and sold to the public. We bought a company that made uh, insulated packaging materials uh, up in uh, St. Louis and um, uh, as, used the same raw material that, that this company was manufactured called Texturine was the name of the company that was manufactured. So we made two or three acquisitions along that line over the period of the next two to three years. Uh, and then uh, all of those involved the same kind of financing approach. Uh, it was all leverage in one fashion or another. Creativity in putting financing packages together to support these acquisitions. We never put any more equity into the, into the business. Some years later, three or four years later, uh, we took that company public. Um, That's what I was going to ask. So that was another. So that was how do you get out? How do you like? What was was there a strategy of how long you hold it? Do you sell it to other like you know uh, uh, industry whatever industry competitors? Do you take it public? There's there's all these uh, options. So that, that was there a strategy? I mean, uh, well, you know, it, it, it's very the, the strategy was very much like what I call the ultra high net worth family office has today, and and how an ultra high net worth family office competes with the private equity fund. The private equity fund has a defined life. They've got to buy, build up the business sell the business within the life of their fund so that they can yeah. prove up a, a, a rate of return to raise right. money for their next fund. Right. A family office can be as patient and as long-term as they want to be with an investment. And they don't have to look at an exit. I've got to sell this in seven years. Okay, I've got to take it public, thanks to that variety. What happened to us in this situation is that the market just, just moved in our favor. And, and there was a market for IPOs at that point in time. We had a very attractive business. Um, and, and we were able to accomplish that. Uh, and then some years later, uh, we sold that company, actually sold it in parts. Scott Paper bought the plastic bead business. A group of private investors bought the coffee cup business. <laughs> so uh, it then and, got deconstructed, got put yeah. together and then taken apart. And That's you right. And going both ways. Yes. <laughs> yes. What, what, what's the scale? What were, can you, I, I mean, are you allowed to talk about the size or the scale of these? Like, I, I, I'm still amazed, like, and then what, you're still not 40 yet, or you've approached 40 at this point? I mean, when you were, when this was happening, or yeah. somewhere between 30 and 40. So, and like, what were the, I mean, it seems like you were doing pretty massive things at a very young age. That, I mean, that, but I'm, but I'm not, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Well, I don't know, but I, I, I can give you an example. I'll, I'll move on to the, to the next group of companies that we bought. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, so um, uh, along the way, and I'm not, I, I think by, by this time, what we had done was it, it wasn't just me at this point, okay? I had brought in a couple of people to work with me uh, in the office in Dallas. Uh, and then subsequently, we opened an office in New York City in Midtown Manhattan, uh, just off Park Avenue, uh, because we were interfacing and we were financing a lot of these transactions with New York City banks, some of the big... Right. 
money center banks in New York at that time. Right. So we had a presence there. Somehow, and I've forgotten exactly how this came about, we were introduced to the uh, recreational boating industry. And there was, a, there was a company for sale, and I believe it had an investment bank that was representing the company. Uh, I've forgotten the name at this point, but uh, the company was located uh, north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And we looked at the business. We thought it was a very attractive company, but lenders were very skeptical about lending into what they considered to be a very cyclical industry. So these were recreational uh, power boats, cabin cruisers, things of that variety. We really liked the people, liked the business, thought we could, uh, thought we could uh, um, uh, be successful in owning it. Uh, and, but uh, we had a very difficult time financing, raising the money, raising the capital, raising the financing to acquire the company. And it got down to a point where one bank in New York said, look, we will fund half the requirement, but you've got to find the other half somewhere else. I thought, great, now we've got something to work with. This will be easy. Well, it wasn't easy. In fact, we got down to the point where we had one last lender. And I said to our guys, I'm going to go to Arizona. I'm going to meet with this lender. If they turn us down, we're calling this transaction off because we just cannot finance this deal. Lo and behold, they said yes. So we bought the company. Uh, two years later, we bought uh, another company. And then we built new manufacturing facilities down in the Carolinas. Um, and then we bought the Ranger Bass Boat Company, which might be a name you might recognize, famous for building bass fishing boats. Anyway, long story short with all of that, we, uh, uh, we were able to uh, uh, then accomplish what's called a leverage dividend. And a leverage dividend is where you borrow money to pay a dividend out to the shareholders, okay? And so uh, we were very successful. This was, this was, again, kind of cutting edge finance technology, if you will, in those days. And so we were able to, uh, to do that with the assistance of uh, the Bank of New York, uh, who funded the original dividend. Um, it, it took almost $100 million in financing to be able to accomplish that. And then uh, within about six months after funding the dividend, we did a long-term uh, the term junk bond placement through Drexel Burnham to refinance the Bank of New York debt. So the debt gives you an idea. So if you think about what we did in these first two investments, the one with the plastics business and the one with the boating, it's what became popular later on called the buy and build strategy. You buy a platform investment and you look to build on it with additional acquisition. So there were two that, right. two that turned out extremely well for us. Now I have a question that I'm just, I'm intrigued by. So you said that the family office, ultra net worth office, they don't have to play by the same rules as the funds. So, which means wh why would like, and you really like the business, why wouldn't you put 50% of the capital up yourself in that, in that, if you really thought it was, a, if you really believed in the business, you know, obviously more capital, you're going to get even a, you know, you're going to get a, you're going to get a, you know, you don't, you have less debt to deal with and, yeah. and if it makes yeah. sense. So, but that just never, that never, that's just not something they didn't do, or I, I don't know what was. Yeah, I, I think our appetite was larger than our ability to do that <laughs> at that okay. time, if you will. And, and because the market would, you know, the, the, the market would finance these things. I mean, why use your capital? If okay, so you would rather have, you'd rather it. do two deals than, than two or three deals with that money rather than uh, exactly. do one. If you're sticking one into one, mm -hmm. so you're basically share, you know, spreading the, you're, again, you're spreading the risk. I was just wondering if you felt really strongly about a business. At some point, maybe it's worth. Um, no, ob yeah, obviously, in, in this uh, area, people are going to try and deceive you, right? They're going to try and exaggerate how great their businesses are. And I wanted to ask about how you judge a, how you judged a potential target acquisition in terms, obviously, you've got the numbers, you've got the leadership, but what are the things that you looked at maybe harder than some other people? And did you ever experience people trying to like hoodwink you like either big scale or small scale and did you ever get taken in did you ever make mistakes that you could share or like what's the what, it's a deal that went really pear-shaped and basically that, that was on you <laughs> we don't have enough time to talk about all of those okay <laughs> <laughs> well look one of the things that uh that, that was very important from the very beginning uh 
uh, and, and it's still critically important today with, with anyone making an acquisition is, is, is your whole due diligence process. And so I think that uh, when we were uh, when we were doing the first transactions, uh, it, it was a less sophisticated process than it, than it is today. Uh, but we've kind of prided ourselves on being able to really do the financial due diligence uh, of a business to determine and, and believe that the information they had provided us was factual and was correct and that we could rely upon it. Uh, in addition, we had excellent legal counsel. Um, and there was a firm here in Dallas that uh, really represented us on all of our uh, all of our acquisitions and all of our financings. So we kind of formed a great team with with that law firm to come in and do all of the all of the legal due diligence and and and, and we did the business due diligence. On occasion, we would reach out and we'd bring in a third party consulting firm. I recall one transaction we brought in McKinsey uh, to do a a third party uh, research on a company in Los Angeles that we were in the process of buying. So uh, that has evolved over, over time in terms of, of the diligence process. That process was all internal that we basically accomplished ourselves. Today, uh, when you're doing an acquisition, you're looking externally to some of one of the major accounting firms or uh, the next level accounting firms or private firms that do this work that do what's called quality of earnings reports, okay? And the quality of earnings report is something that is a very forensic look at uh, the accounting uh, and at the financial statements, far more so than just a regular audit would be. And that's a regular part of any transaction today. The buyer is relying upon uh, that report uh, and uh, the lenders are relying upon that report. So I'm involved in a transaction right now where I'm representing the seller of a company. It's being sold to a portfolio company of KKR. Well, you can imagine what the diligence process KKR has. It's about as sophisticated as, as, as you can get. Uh, they have retained an accounting, a national accounting firm to come in and do this quality of earnings report. They probably have 15 people assigned to that particular job. They've retained counsel to come in and do a complete legal review of all the contracts, uh, all the documents uh, and things of that variety. So where, where we started back in, well, those days with the Thompson Company and the Thompson family, that whole process has evolved now to become a far more yeah. uh, um, uh, common sort of way that, that people look to do these transactions. Yeah, it's pretty cookie, it's pretty cookie cutter now. I mean, the, the way they the way they do it. I mean, like there's so many companies that do it. I mean, the, as you said, it's a very mature. It's very mature. That space is very mature now. It's a mature um, business these days. You're right. Yeah. And, and, and but in terms of the personal sort of John Sloan take on this, uh, and you, I don't know whether you dodged the question about any mistakes, but if you could just pick, pick one, because the, the point part of the point of what we're doing here, John, is like to share lessons that might be useful to someone else. And there might be someone listening who one day is looking at making an acquisition. And if you could share out, for God's sake, don't do what John did then, that might save yeah. someone tens of millions of dollars. So that might yeah. be a value add to our listeners. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, that, that I've learned along the way is, is you don't fall in love with the business. OK, ah, that's a good one. And, uh, and um, so, uh, for example, I'll tell you a, a good and a bad story. The, 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 the bad story or, or the good story was when we looked at buying the recreational boating business. OK, maybe five years prior to that, with a friend of mine here in Dallas, we purchased a boat and we had it on the lake outside of Dallas. And that boat was nothing but trouble from the day we bought it <laughs> until we finally sold it a, a year or so later. Uh, and it was just a hassle to deal with. There was always mechanical problems, always repairs to be funded and things of that variety. So when it came into the opportunity to buy the recreational boating business, I had, frankly, a pretty negative view of what that business was about. And I had to get over that to be able to uh, to buy that company. Uh, and fortunately, that worked out very successfully. Another one that I fell in love with that uh, didn't work out quite so well was a company uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, the company no longer exists, but the name of the company was called Applause. Applause <laughs> was the name of the company. So what Applause did was they contracted with all of the major movie studios to produce uh, their kind of plush animals from their characters in their in, in their movies. So you go back to start with Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse and then um, uh, California Raisins and everything else that came along the way. 
you know, and it was one of those things that you kind of got infatuated with, with sort of the movie <laughs> industry and, <laughs> and the products and the, and the marketing right. and, uh, and all of that. Uh, that transaction didn't work out so well for us. <laughs> so you, you've got to have a really a critical eye, I think, in being successful in, in these. And it takes, it, it takes some experience and it takes, you know, getting your chops busted a time or two along the way. And did you tend to leave the executive management intact after the acquisition or did you replace them or was it case by case? And in the cases where you kept people on, what sort of people were you looking for to run these businesses? Because you weren't running them yourself, were you? No, was not. Uh, we, we had a very capable kind of corporate team between Dallas and New York, but we were dependent and relied upon the operating and management of each, each company that, that we bought. And uh, uh, the way that we kept, and, and typically that was that was the owner who was selling us the business. And, and we would look for ways to keep the owner, even though we were happy for him to have a nice payday in selling the company, we wanted him to have or her to have continuing ties to the business financially. So we would ask that they retain a minority ownership interest in the company. Skin in the we, game. Skin in the game. Uh, we may ask that they finance part of the transaction as opposed to taking cash. They take back a note from the company mm -hmm. that gets paid out over a period of time. So even though they may have had a nice payday, they weren't going to walk away from the money that they still left right. on the table or still had involved in it. And, and that is still the model uh, today. Uh, in, in, in acquisitions is, is the management team is really critical. Making sure they have the right motivation to stay involved is, is an important part of being successful. I assume these companies were all very uh, profitable. I mean, they looked good on paper because in nowadays, you know, you know how things are, particularly in venture capital. I mean, you, you just have ideas and people throw a whole lot of money at them. And, 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 and but I, I assume everything we're talking about were, were brick and mortar nuts and bolts like it makes x amount of ebitda and you know you're paying on even a multiples and so you're basically buying healthy businesses exactly right we, it, didn't, yeah. we, we didn't buy we didn't buy uh, uh distress businesses or turnaround yeah. situations uh we right. did make a couple of uh maybe passive investments uh in in earlier stage or more like venture capital type investments uh, those by and large did not mm -hmm. work out very well for us. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we, we found that really, you know, mm -hmm. buying an existing business, working to make it better, building on it with add on transactions, add on acquisitions was, was a good model for us. And that's still the, that's still the basic model for the private equity world today. And obviously, I mean, I'm conscious of time and I, I get the sense there's a chunk of your career we haven't, we haven't yes, covered. Yes, we yet. should keep going, keep going. <laughs> well, Let's keep um, going. What did you do next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the, 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 the next thing involved the 7-Eleven business, okay? And uh, we've been doing this for a few years. We had built up uh, at, at, the, at the height of our business. I think we bought 22 companies. Uh, wow. And at, at the in peak what of, in what time sprint? You know how long did it take you to buy twenty two companies? Uh, ten twelve years, something like that. That's amazing. Say. That's okay. amazing. So at the peak, we had uh, companies that we that we owned or owned controlling interest in that had just under a billion dollars a year in revenues and about four thousand employees over these three or four platform investments uh, that that right. we had. And through that time, I've had the opportunity to build upon my relationships, uh, my Wall Street relationships, okay, in particular with, uh, with the Wall Street money center banks and with the, uh, um, uh, with the investment banks uh, in, in New York and, and in Los Angeles. And so um, thinking, you know, what's the next great idea? What's the next great opportunity? And so one day it hit me that, uh, you know, the, 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 the next best and, and, and most significant investment that the family could make would be to buy the 7-Eleven business, the New York Stock Exchange Company, because they were you the founders. You mean take it private? Take it private. They, they were the founders. They were the uh, managers of the business, uh, the ex principal executives. They knew the business better than anybody else in the world would ever know mm -hmm. it. And so I, uh, I proposed to the family that, uh, that, that we do that. And um, I remember uh, uh, taking a yellow pad. Uh, this was before laptop computers in, in those days and, and a little handheld computer and, and put together a financial model for how I thought the financing could look, how the deal would work. 
And they said, well, look, we've never even thought about something like this. It's such a huge deal. Uh, why don't you go to New York and visit with this investment bank and let them tell us what they think about it? So I did so. Two weeks later, the investment bank comes back and they said, we think this is an eminently financeable transaction. So there were steps along the way, but ultimately, uh, about two years later, we actually did the going private transaction for 7 Eleven. It was the largest going private transaction in the history of the New York Stock Exchange at that time, a little over $5 billion. It involved a combination of, of, of bank debt uh, and public debt that we were able to sell. Uh, and the family came away with only 100% uh, of the business after that. So that was a pretty exciting experience to work through and be a part of that transaction. Three years later, we came back and we sold the overall business to our international licensee in Japan, itself a publicly held company. It had been a 20-year relationship, but it was a separate publicly held company in Japan called 7-Eleven Japan. Uh, and, and they purchased uh, all of the United States interests from, uh, from, uh, from the Thompson family. So that was, that was kind of the, what I call my 15 minutes of fame in business was to be involved in that a particular transaction because it was originally my idea to do it, but the family sponsored me in that process uh, uh, with some challenges along the way. We were able to we were able to get that accomplished. So uh, that was that was sort of the thing that was kind of the uh, point that the family decided they wanted to basically the, the three brothers kind of retire, support their children who were getting involved in business, uh, and we started to liquidate the other companies that we had acquired. Uh, after that particular transaction closed up. So that was an exciting time and it was exciting finance time uh, as, as well. How, how much the Thompson that, family uh, must have really liked you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We had more fun <laughs> involved in those transactions than, than you could possibly imagine. And the family was so incredibly supportive of me, probably more so than they should have been, but they were so incredibly supportive of me uh, and, and we had more fun along the way uh, doing these things. And they would, you know, we would we would periodically get them involved in, in going and visiting one of the businesses. We had we, we had something we call the annual meeting, the family meeting once a year, where we brought in the people who manage these companies and made presentations to the nice. family about what they're doing and how the businesses were performing uh, and, and that sort of thing. But it, it was a it was a terrific ride for all of us. I'm sure many of our listeners are thinking, I wonder how much the family made on that $5 billion. Uh, <laughs> can, can, you put, can you give a ballpark number of what the rate of return was? No. <laughs> 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 Just to shortcut the conversation. Yeah. No. But I would say this, it, it, it did work out very successful for, uh, for the family, as did a lot of our our, our, our private companies as well. So, so you liquidated all those, all those companies. So you had a bucket load of cash sitting in the business at this stage because you sold them all off and then what did you do well at that point things were winding down with the thompson company uh, the family wanted to have a lower profile uh, the three brothers did and then i think there's something like 11 children between the three of them so they those children were getting into their 20s and they wanted to pursue their business careers and they needed support from their families uh, and, and so forth and the family wanted to move along in in that direction so uh i was still at that point interested in you know, being active, I was probably what early forties, I guess, at, at this point in time. And I that's decided incredible. I, I wanted to, to to go and do some entrepreneurial uh, things, uh, uh, and, and I did. Uh, one of those uh, turned out to be pretty successful. It was in the a very unique uh, uh, part of the auto finance uh, world, uh, and I was able with a partner to sponsor a company that we raised. Uh, we raised about $100 million to develop that particular business. Um, and then uh, just kind of not quite sure looking back exactly how and why this happened, but uh, there was a small investment bank here in Dallas that I'd gotten to know. I'd looked at several of their companies for sale, hadn't bought anything from them, but they had a business that I thought was very attractive. And I thought that if I could raise the money to buy that business, I would really, I would really like to be involved in that. So I spent about a year working on that, unfortunately, unsuccessfully. But at the end of that time, the, uh, the owner of the, of, the, of the investment bank was said, look, uh, we've enjoyed working with you and you know, you've got relationships and all that we don't have. Why don't you join us and, and we'll continue to work with you while you're looking for your next great adventure <laughs> that you want to do. 
And so that's how I got into the investment banking world. Okay. And then how long did this last? Still going on. <laughs> <laughs> so the next great it's, adventure, this was the next great adventure. This was the next great adventure, okay? And so, I so basically about, they, they cut you in as a partner, basically. You became a partner. That is correct. Yeah, That's correct. It. I had a partner. Uh, he was he was the majority shareholder. I was the minority shareholder, but a significant minority shareholder. There were just the two of us. And so we worked for a number of years very, very successfully together, had just a great relationship, uh, did a number of, I mean, these, these what called lower middle market uh, transactions are really where business owners need the advice of an investment banker, okay? I'm not sure that if you got two publicly held companies that are merging and you've got, you know, Goldman Sachs on one side and Morgan Stanley yeah. on the other, that, that what value do you add in, in that particular process? Uh, because you got very sophisticated parties all the way around. But a owner of a privately held business, he knows at some point in time he wants to monetize his life's work, uh, but he doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know what's involved in doing it. He's not prepared to do it. And so that's where... I kind of migrated to in my career. It was working with the owners of privately held businesses. Sometimes it was raising capital for their company to grow the business. Sometimes it was selling the company. Uh, occasionally it was buying another company that they wanted to acquire in an acquisition. Uh, and I found that uh, that was rewarding in a couple of aspects. One, obviously it was financially rewarding, but two, I got a lot of personal satisfaction out of just helping people to accomplish their dreams and their goals in business. Um, and that proved how, to be- How big, something. like a low, this middle market, lower middle market, it's about a hundred million revenue <laughs> business or, or smaller, 50 million. What's the, what's the definition of that? Well, in, in our world in those days, I think the smaller transactions that I worked on were maybe 15 or $20 million. Okay. The, okay. the, the largest was 200 million. Uh, oh, okay. And, so it's a huge, so, it's, yeah. So it's a huge range, and, and there were all sorts of things in the middle. But I found that working with entrepreneurs is a lot of fun, and yeah. it's a big challenge. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> because an entrepreneur is a, is is a different breed of cat <laughs> that's out there, and uh, so developing that uh, relationship uh, again uh, is is building the trust uh, between yourself and your client is is really fundamental to making these transactions successful. And so people in this sector of the market, they they need our help, not just me, but other investment bankers in this sector of the market. They they need the help that we can provide. So there's a lot of personal satisfaction that comes to me from that. And, and you mentioned the character of entrepreneurs and them being difficult. And obviously they're not all the same. There are some are charming, friendly, others are very greedy and aggressive, yeah. um, but, if you're looking for things that the entrepreneurs you came across had in common, what would you say the most common characteristics? You, if you're trying to pick up, well, most entrepreneurs are like this, and what makes it, what, and secondly, what makes a good one? Because again, we want to be helpful to our listeners, and a lot of people out here, maybe the reason they listen is that they want to be an entrepreneur, or well, they, sure. they, they, they feel that this could be their destiny. Sure, absolutely. Well, my, my, my late partner had a, had a saying, and that was that, uh, uh, that, that a business owner, a privately held business owner, only cared about one person's opinion, his own. <laughs> okay, so these fellows are very, ladies too, but very independent. Uh, they, their mind does not associate with the word risk. Okay, so as yes, an example, one of the companies that uh, I was involved in, I was representing the buyer of this company was down in Louisiana. Uh, and this individual had, um, had a dream of operating a boat that would carry fuel and supplies and people from the shore out to the drilling platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. And people told him it was a ridiculous idea. He just was convinced it was the greatest thing in the world that he wanted to do. <laughs> so he found this dilapidated, probably unseaworthy boat <laughs> that he was able to finance and buy the boat. And he started, he started this business from that. I think the boat lasted about six months and then they had to go in for half a million dollars worth of repairs, but it became what I call the UPS model. And so what it would do is had a whole fleet of these boats and these boats would leave the dock in the mornings and they would go out on a delivery route. 
and they would stop at three or four drilling platforms out in the Gulf, drop off supplies and people and whatever's needed, pick up people, bring them back to shore, uh, things of that variety. And he built up an incredible business. Uh, as I said, I represented the buyer. He was the sole owner of the company. I represented the buyer. We paid $200 million of cash for that company. Okay. So risk, you know, and uh, other, other clients I've had, especially in the oil field service sector, that would be, a, that would be an oil field service business I just described to you. And I've done a lot of work out in the Permian Basin in West Texas and New Mexico and up in New York State and up in Alberta, Canada. Uh, risk is not something an entrepreneur understood, uh, understands because if they did, they would never do the things that they've done to be successful. <laughs> All right. I think and, that's uh, a very valid, very good point. So where what gets what gets you excited nowadays? Like what's the, the where where are you now at this point uh, in your life? Like what's your what, what, what is you still the same stuff or is there anything in particular that but really that really gets you excited about that you get excited about? Look, I I, I get excited about meeting and dealing with entrepreneurs. Okay, I, and I still do. Uh, every M and A transaction that I've been involved in. There are some common factors in each, but each one is new and different and has different complications. Uh, I particularly enjoyed over recent years being involved in this organization called Global Scope. And I served on the board of directors for about five or six years. And then about a year ago, they asked me to be president of the organization. So this is an organization of 55 independent merger and acquisition focused investment banks around the world. I think we operate in four, 48 countries. We've got about 400 investment bankers in the organization. Last year, we closed over 200 M&A transactions at an aggregate value of over $8 billion. So that's something that I'm excited about. And it gives me the opportunity to work with my partner firms. I've just closed a ninth transaction a couple of months ago with a partner firm in, um, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, I'm working on a transaction now with our, one of our partner firms in Japan. They represent a large trading, multi-billion dollar trading company who wants to come to the U.S. and make an acquisition. And so I'm working on the acquisition front with them. So I'm still excited to do those things. I'm still excited to see new ideas and new, new, new businesses and meet new people. Uh, the, the, the people are the, the people are the really enjoyable part of this business to me. Uh, uh, and it's been a lot of fun, and it's still a lot of fun. And I, I envision myself continuing to do this for uh, for a while longer. That's nice. fantastic. And I, we're getting very close to the end, but it's a very challenging business environment. We've got inflation, crazy, well, crazy, very unusual monetary policy, you know, war, supply shocks. If you think about the current business landscape and where it's going, do you think these challenges make it a better time for M&A or do you think that it's going to be a very tough couple of years? We're, we're recording this, by the way, in, uh, in August 2022. Yeah. So I would tell you that uh, uh, in, in terms of the number of transactions completed during the first half of the year, it's down 50% from last year. Uh, last year was real high mark in, uh, in, in terms of M&A activity, but it's down, it, it's down quite a bit. Uh, but there's still opportunities out there. And you can see that when I've just told you, I'm involved in several very interesting transactions that are going on right now. So uh, does it take a little bit uh, digging deeper? Uh, does it take a little more creativity? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, but I would tell you there is still, uh, there is still an ample supply of capital out there for uh, uh, for yeah, I'd say these there, days. I'd say there's a premium on, on higher quality companies since they're, because they're, they're probably going <laughs> Toward, they're probably moving toward quality. Um, the quality of the companies is, is becomes probably more important. So maybe the better, the, like if you have a really good company, maybe you can. Maybe it isn't a bad time to do it now because there's like they're going to be more picky about the the, the deals that yeah. they want to finance. One of the services <clears throat> that I subscribe to uh, uh, through the first half of the year said that the that the average EBITDA multiple paid was seven point four times. Okay, and that is not an outrageous number. All right, yeah. to pay for a business at all. And like you said, uh, Richard, the, the, the quality of the transaction seems to be escalating now. I'm working on the buy side of a company uh, here in the Dallas area that I think is one of the really prime, premier construction related businesses here. Uh, and I'm just starting the financing process there, but I've got a lot of interest 
in, in financing that business. There's a lot of pent-up capital out there now. Uh, while, while interest rates have, have moved a bit higher, to this point, it hasn't impacted a, a buyer's decision to, you know, right. to buy or not buy. So, John, if you had the, if somebody was listening here, and I, I, I suspect there will be people listening that are very interested, because I, there are a lot of people that are interested in your space in M&A, investment banking, how, what kind of advice, and let's say that there's just some young kid that's listening to this, would, be, what, would there be any advice in particular that you'd give this person? Well, uh, yes. I mean, number one is education, <laughs> okay, starting out, okay, which is the framework for anything. And then what kind of an say, education should they get? Where should they go? What what should they focus on? I mean, just general business degree, MBA, economics. What what would you? You know, it, it, it's very interesting. Some of the most uh, successful investment bankers that I have known do not have finance degrees. They may okay. have had chemical engineering <laughs> degrees or or things like that, but they migrated to this to this M and A world. I would think that a great training ground, you know, what, whatever route you want to pursue through, through college and through education, whether it's accounting, it's finance, it's marketing, it's you, you name it, you know, to, to, to get involved early in your career um, with a firm that's very active, whether that could be an investment bank in New York, whether that could be a private equity fund, somebody that's involved in the corporate merger and acquisition world where you learn the basics about financial modeling, where you learn the basics about how you finance transactions, where you learn the basics about what due diligence is all about, particularly where you learn a lot of the basics about the law that applies to these transactions, okay? Because the legal parts of these transactions are something that an investment banker has to be very, very astute in understanding the ramifications of what's involved in a 75 or 100 page acquisition document. And so, Get involved with someone who's active uh, in, in doing those things. Learn your trade for, for a period of years and, and then step back and evaluate what you want to do moving forward. Maybe the continuation of that's a great path. Maybe it's moving out and doing your own thing, which a lot of people do, is, is, a, is a good path. But it's a fertile ground that's going to be out there. It's going to be ongoing from, from now on. Uh, and it's a, it, it's a great and exciting career. To have. Awesome. Thanks for that. So should we wrap it up, Richard? Okay, so John, thanks so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Super interesting. I, I'm sure our listeners got a lot of insights from this. I actually think we should title this uh, something around M&A, because uh, it should be something around M&A, investment banking, because I do think that this will gather interest. We haven't had this sort of deep dive into this topic, and I, I thought that this was really, really, really interesting. So, so John, thanks so much for taking the time. It was really nice to meet you, and I wish you all the best. My pleasure, Carlos. Thanks for seeing you today. Enjoyed it. Indeed. And we'll be putting all the links to John and his businesses in the show notes. So if you want to follow up and look into his businesses in detail, all that information will be there. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And thank you for joining us, John. My pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. Good luck.